Thank you all for standing by and welcome to our webinar entitled A Toxin Forecast for Lake Erie's Harmful Algal Blooms. This is a brand new webinar series called Freshwater Science that will highlight Ohio Sea Grant and partnering scientists every month. Every quarter is a different focus from human health and fish farming to harmful algal blooms and human decision making, bringing applied research to the public on issues that affect our Lake Erie communities. I am Jill Gentis Benicki from Ohio Sea Grant and Stone Laboratory, and joining me today is Dr. Justin Chaffin from Ohio State University Stone Laboratory. Dr. Chaffin is a senior researcher and research coordinator at Stone Laboratory. His research interest is Lake Erie phytoplankton ecology, with particular interest in cyanobacterial Sino, cyanobacterial blooms. His recent and ongoing research projects include linking experiments and models to predict cyanobacterial bloom toxicity, determining drivers of benthic algal blooms, the effectiveness of data buoys at measuring those bloom biomasses, and rapid microcystin tests. We're delighted to have Dr. Chaffin here today to discuss his research. But before we do, um, just a few mentions about the logistics of the webinar. Uh, during our presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. Uh, afterwards, around 1220, I'll conduct a question and answer session. If you would like to ask a question during the presentation, please feel free to pull up the chat feature anytime during Dr. Chafton's talk, and I will collect and pose your questions out to him at the end of his presentation. Uh, just a reminder, this webinar has auto captioning and is being recorded to be posted onto our website for later viewing. Also, we will post the webinar survey in, a, in the chat feature toward the end of the half an hour. Please take a few minutes after the webinar to fill out that survey. It will help us continue to bring you better webinars. So without any further delay, I'd like to introduce Dr. Justin Chaffin from Ohio State Stone Lab, presenting a toxin forecast for Lake Erie's harmful algal blooms. Justin, you have the baton. Well, you should see my desktop and now you should see my my presentation and so I, I slightly switched the title um this presentation is or the data i'm going to be talking about is, is specific to lake erie and it's specific to microsystems uh this project we are uh, funded by the no eco ad program uh, it really has a couple of different phases but the overall goal of the project is to link experiments with models to develop a microsystem forecast for Lake Erie. Um, so, so, so as you hope, hopefully most of you know, uh, harmful algal blooms are a global problem. Uh, in freshwater, the harmful algal blooms are, are caused by cyanobacteria, which are also called blue-green algae. Um, the blooms are caused by excess phosphorus and nitrogen. And it doesn't really matter where the phosphorus and nitrogen comes from. Once they get into a lake, they will form blooms. And we have these cyanobacteria blooms during the summer because they like warm water. There are many problems associated with, with cyanobacteria blooms. I'm not gonna go into them uh, in much detail. Uh, they produce secondary, secondary metabolites that are toxic, which we call cyanotoxins, um, that have human health and pet and wildlife uh, implications, taste and odor problems associated with being near a beach or uh, your drinking water, uh, negative, ec negative ec economic impacts, negative impacts on the food web. So overall, cyanobacteria blooms are, are bad for the environment, bad for, for people. Uh, cyanobacteria produce a lot of toxic compounds that are called cyanotoxins. And I, uh, I put the slide in here because we often see or you hear the word toxins being used interchangeably for microcystins. And, we're learning that's not the case because cyanobacteria can produce a lot of different compounds that can be toxic. Uh, the main one or the most common and the most studied is microcystin. Microcystins are found in over 80 countries around the world. Uh, microcystins are the main concern for Lake Erie and Ohio EPA. Uh, Ohio EPA mandates that all public water systems test their source water uh, most of them at least weekly during, during the summer. Therefore, we have a lot of data on microcystins in Lake Erie. 
Uh, the main producer of microcystins is microcystis in the main part of the lake and planktothrix in Sandusky Bay. And in order for microcystis to produce microcystins, it needed to have nitrogen available. So nitrogen is uh, uh, clearly important for bloom toxin production. Uh, however, there are many other types of cyanotoxins that I'm not gonna cover in my presentation. Uh, and there's saxotoxins and various forms of anatoxins that might be found in Lake Erie or might be rarely found in Lake Erie. These are mainly being overlooked by monitoring programs. Um, they're, they're slindospermopsins, uh, not necessarily found in Ohio, but they're uh, found more in, in warmer states. And uh, we're learning uh, we're learning about, uh, about, about the anabinopeptins and the regenosins that microcystis can be producing. Uh, so for today, I'm talking about microcystins. And collectively, we should uh, stop using toxins or toxicity when we're talking about microcystins. So uh, I'm, I'm talking about a microcystin concentration forecast, not a toxin forecast. Uh, so again, this is uh, unique or specific to Lake Erie. Uh, Lake Erie has, has cyanobacteria blooms almost every year in the Western Basin of Lake Erie. Um, let me see if I can grab a pointer. So you should be able to see my pointer. Uh, here's the city of Toledo, uh, which had its uh, do not drink advisory in 2014 because microcystins were above uh, uh, the World Health Organization guideline. Uh, blooms can be seen by satellite and remote sensors on satellites can quantify bloom biomass. Uh, we have a Lake Erie harmful algal bloom biomass forecast. Um, there, there's a couple of different versions. Uh, the one that, it, the seasonal one that is normally released in late June, early July, uh, deals with phosphorus load from, from the Maumee River, uh, mainly March through July. When we have more rain, we have a higher phosphorus load, and this higher phosphorus load leads to a larger bloom. This biomass forecast does not factor in cyanotoxins. So it doesn't tell you how toxic the bloom is going to be. It doesn't tell you when the bloom is going to occur or where it's going to occur. It just tells you, it just gives us an early heads up that there's going to be a larger bloom or a smaller bloom, but not, not toxicity. And also note that this toxicity or the, so this biomass forecast is an ensemble of several different models that are um, that they're kind of averaged together. Okay, so it's an ensemble forecast. So when we're talking about microcystins, we want to know is there a relationship between bloom biomass and microcystin concentration? You know, does green water, for example, here, does green water always equal high concentrations, or does clear water always equal low concentrations? So this is just some data we've been putting together for the past several years. Um, cyanobacteria biomass on the X axis and total microcystin concentrations on the Y. Uh, this is with the ELISA method. And overall, you see a significant correlation, but when you zoom into where 98% of the data points lie, you really see there is no correlation between bloom biomass and total microcystins. So therefore, we cannot rely on biomass being a predictor of microcystin concentration. So our objective is to develop a microcystin forecast. There are many other researchers that are developing microcystin forecasts. Uh, some of them are using remote sensing for biomass data, and then they're using the ratio of microcystin to biomass and grab samples. Some are using complex process-based models that factor in various environmental factors like nitrogen, phosphorus concentrations, temperature, pH, and light. Uh, these models are being conducted at the cellular level and also the ecosystem level. Um, we want to we want to use observed microcystin data from grab samples to predict microcystin concentrations one week in advance. That's that's our our approach. 
Um, there are challenges to all microsystem forecasts. Um, first one which I just mentioned, there's no relationship between microsystem concentration and bloom biomass. Remote sensing cannot detect microsystems. Remote sensing can only see biomass. Grab samples are needed for microsystems. So you actually have to have a water sample to measure microsystems. And even though there is a lot of data in Lake Erie, Lake Erie is a very large body of water. And when you spread those data points out throughout the lake, it's relatively few and far between. Uh, there is a poor spatial and temporal resolution of microsystem data compared to the remote sensing biomass data. So, uh, uh, so our approach that we use for this EcoHab uh, project is to link microsystem data that we have in the lake, uh, link hydrodynamic models and cyanobacteria biology to develop a microsystem forecast. Uh, so there are three components we need. Um, we start off with weekly maps of microsystem concentrations, and this can be a whole presentation in itself. Uh, but we get data from many different sources, uh, university researchers, federal agencies, Ohio EPA, charter boat captains, and public water systems. So we take all their data, and we make a weekly map of microsystems in Lake Erie. We take that map, and then we plug it into a hydrodynamic model that moves water around the lake. As it's moving water around the lake, it's also carrying microsystems. So it can be concentrating microsystems along the shoreline if we have a north or a east wind, or it can be moving microsystems further in the lake if we have a south or a west wind. Then we also want to add in microsystem production rates, uh, which we measure experimentally. And then if we add you know, these three components together, our goal is to uh, make a forecast that can tell microsystems uh, several days into the future. I'm going to start off by talking about uh, how we measured microsystem production rate in the lab. So this is the linking the experiments to the models part. So for microsystem production, I'm going to uh, just gloss over these methods. Um, we just published a paper in LNO. Um, so if you want the details, you can uh, go find this paper. Uh, but we, we use microcosm experiments there in 2018 and 2019. Uh, two sites, one in Maumee Bay, one in the middle of the basin. And we did these experiments uh, uh, six times at each site uh, throughout the bloom season. Uh, we incubated our mesocosms in situ at the Lake Erie Center and at Stone Lab for the two, two sites. Uh, we looked at ambient nutrient concentrations and elevated phosphorus and nitrogen. And we weren't necessarily concerned at which nutrient was limiting at the time. So we just wanted to see what is happening in the lake ambient and if we elevate phosphorus and nitrogen to try to maximize production rate. And then we replicated each three times. Uh, the experiments ran for three days and we collected microcystin concentration daily. And if you plot the natural log of microcystin versus time, the slope is a production rate, is a, is a production rate constant. And you can see in this example, the control actually had a slight decrease in concentrations. Whereas when we added phosphorus and nitrogen, it didn't matter what form of nitrogen, there was a positive positive increase. So looking at the data over time, I'm going to plot for 2018 and 2019 uh, the, the production rates. The black circles or the black icons are going to be the control, and then the white ones are the maximum of the phosphorus and nitrogen treatments. And then the circles are in Maumee Bay, and the triangles are uh, in the middle of the Western Basin. So for this first one we did, we see uh, the control rate being near zero, whereas phosphorus and nitrogen uh, increased it to about 0.3. And on this scale, um, the, the growth rate of 0.7, uh, uh, growth rate of our production rate of 0.7 roughly equals a doubling per day. So I just want to keep that in mind to uh, uh, put these results into context. So 0.7 means it's doubling in one day. Looking at all the data, 
uh, we see that uh, production rates decreased throughout the season. So maximum production rates occur early season, decrease late in season. And we also see that adding phosphorus and nitrogen resulted in higher production. Um, that's pretty obvious what, what we expected, you know, there being nitrogen limited, phosphorus limited. Um, uh, so production rates decreased throughout the summer and adding phosphorus and nitrogen uh, increased production. So going back to our overall scheme, you know, we just measured production rates. So how do we plug it in to um, this framework? Um, you know, we don't really know what's happening. You know, our, it, it's hard to actually measure what's happening in the lake. So we measured it uh, within the control and phosphorus and nitrogen. Um, so what to overcome that, we took the average of the control and the phosphorus and nitrogen production rates to try to see, you know, maybe this might be a uh, more realistic number. Um, so we have our maps, we have the FBCOM model, and now we have production rates. So our modeling experiments, what we did, uh, these were ran by Peng Kei at uh, you know, Michigan Tech University. Uh, we did weekly simulations in 2018 and 2019. Uh, we started the model on Monday, it ran for seven days, and then we compared the model output to the observed data for seven uh, the, to the new reserve data. And then we restarted the model each week. So it's not, we ran, we started July 1 and just let it run. We got data for July 1, ran it for seven days, restarted on July 8 and restarted again. Um, so we're, we are relying on reserve data for this model. We ran simulations with and without microsystem production and the output concentrations were compared to the eight monitoring sites uh, in the Western Basin by uh, Noah, Gloro, and Sigler. And questions that we asked uh, to help us interpret our data, we asked, did microcystins increase, decrease, or remain the same from week to week? Uh, was microcystins above or below certain threshold concentrations? And then did the model output agree with the observed data? So did, if the model went up, if the model said microcystins were going to increase and the observed microcystins increased, then we called that a, you know, uh, an accurate model. Uh, we also did a, a high intensity, um, a, high, a high spatial resolution model. Um, here's our map for July 29. Uh, greens, you see the color scale. So mostly in the the one to five range, what we're starting with. And then seven days later on the Habs grab, uh, we see the, we see really high concentrations in Maumee Bay. So those are the observed uh, for the start and final. Our model without microcystin production, uh, here's this result. You see the spatial pattern of the model output looks similar to the observed, so that's good. So we know hydrodynamics can move microsystems around. But also note that within Maumee Bay, we do not have those high concentrations that were, were observed. With microsystem production in, included, we do get those high concentrations in Maumee Bay. Um, so putting them side by side with microsystem production and then without. So this says that microsystem production is needed to be included in the models um, in order to forecast high concentrations. Uh, and then, you know, we have all this data and, and uh, trying to display it all is somewhat challenging. Uh, I'm just showing two, two simulations here. This top group are model results with microsystem production and the bottom is without microsystem production. Uh, for the, and then on the y-axis are each NOAA site, and then the X columns are uh, the date the model started. Uh, blues and dark blues are correct. And for this, we just asked, did microsystem increase, decrease, or stay the same over seven days? The dark blues say the model suggested increase, and the observed data said they increased. So that's a valid model. The light blue, they both agreed that concentrations would decrease and purple is correct and saying that there will be no net change from week to week. 
the grays and whites are our false alarms. So our model said it would increase, where it actually it decreased. And then white is a miss. So um, observed data went up where microcystin data or our model said it would not. So if you just look at these ones, you see there's more blues when we have microcystin production. Um, looking at looking at us spatially, this WV12 site is near the Toledo water intake. Um, this model is 88% accurate across the two years with microcystin production compared to only 68% when we didn't factor in microcystin production. Uh, so we have a lot of figures like this and we can go into it and talk about um, why the model was correct, why it was not correct. We can look at temporal patterns and spatial patterns. You know, why did the model per uh, why was the model better at some sites and not others? Why was the model better early summer versus uh, in the fall? Uh, to summarize all, all our results, uh, we, we pooled um, the percent correct for the trend analysis, uh, asking if microsystems would be greater than 0.3 and would they be greater than 0.1. Uh, looking at by year, we see our models are better in 2019 than 2018. And that can be, um, you think of 2019 was a much larger bloom. So this might suggest that larger blooms might be easier to forecast than smaller blooms. And we also saw that when microcystin production was included, our model is about 11% more accurate than when it wasn't included. Uh, there are some caveats within that, though. In 2018, which was a smaller bloom, uh, microcystin production tend to have uh, resulted in more false alarms. So we were overestimating uh, production in 2018. In 2019, however, the model without microcystin production only hit seven of the observed 35 uh, measurements of microcystin greater than five micrograms per liter. So this says, you know, for a model to run seven days to hit high concentrations, you need to factor in microsystem production rates. So to, uh, to summarize, forecasting microsystems in Lake Erie, there are several groups working on, on models. It's just not me. There's many different groups using many different approaches. Um, the Lake Erie biomass forecast is an ensemble of, of models. And I believe that a microsystem forecast will likely also be an ensemble uh, of different models. So the summary of our work, uh, we saw microsystem production was nutrient limited and maximum production rates decreased throughout the HAB season. Uh, even though we were given the bloom phosphorus and nitrogen, you know, in, in late August into September, they were not matching the production rates that we saw in early summer. And that could be due to light limitation. So there's shorter photo, photo periods, less sunlight late season. There's also a shift from non-toxic strands throughout, throughout the re, uh, growing season. So the first start of the, as the blooms initiate, most of the cells out there are toxic. They can produce microcystins. Late in bloom, most of the cells are non-toxic. They cannot produce microcystins. Uh, we also saw that hydrodynamics can be used to forecast the position or the location of microcystins. And we also saw a, a microcystin, including microcystin production rates into the hydrodynamic models can improve our forecast. Um, our, our models were more accurate in 2019, uh, which was a larger bloom in higher concentrations. And microcystin production uh, in the model is needed to forecast uh, higher concentrations of microsystems. And with that, I'd like to thank um, the No Ecohab program and the, the, our, our collaborators working on this project. Um, uh, our project's also partly funded by Oceans and Human Health, uh, award to BGSU. And throughout the years, we had several awards from various Ohio agencies. Um, we had many authors on the HabGrab manuscript, which I briefly talked about, and the numerous uh, Stone Labs seasonal staff and our undergrad students. Uh, so with that, Jill, I'll be happy to take questions.
All right, great. Thank you, Justin. We have gotten some great questions during uh, uh, Dr. Chaffin's presentation. So let me get started and ask him as many as we can what questions he can't answer today. We'll post later on uh, with his answers on the website. All right, so um, one of, uh, we've gotten several questions dealing with, um, could you talk a little bit about um, what are the factors that really drive toxicity? Okay, um, so there's something else I wanna mention that, so microcystin concentration does not necessarily equal toxicity. Uh, microcystins are a class of over 200 types of, of molecules. Um, for the most part, we're focused on total concentration, which the different congeners of microcystin tell you what is toxicity. Um, microcystin LR is very toxic. Microcystin RR is not toxic. Um, so I, I assume the question is about you know, what drives total microcystin concentration. Um, uh, th there's a lot that we're learning. Um, uh, first, you need you have to have cells that can produce toxins. So you have to have the microcystin genes present. Um, those tend to be more present early bloom. Those tend to be present. Uh, those pr microcystin producing strands are uh, tend to be selected for by high nitrogen concentrations and high light concentration. So we see those in uh, the, the early bloom phase. Uh, so nitrogen and light are, are fairly important. Um, we had gotten another question about how do um, wind shifts change the effect of uh, algae growth? Um, so the wind, There's two things there. Wind will, if it's too rough, there's lots of wind and waves. Uh, microcystis doesn't like that those conditions. They microcystis likes relatively calm water, so it can float to the surface, get sunlight, uh, and it likes to be able to position itself in the water column. So it's, when it's really rough, microcystis doesn't like those conditions. Um, then it can move the bloom around by moving. The water masses around. So if we in Lake Erie, if you get an east wind, the bloom will get more concentrated towards Toledo. If we get a west wind, it can get further spread uh, spread further into the lake. Could you talk a little bit about how um, water temperature uh, plays in uh, the effects of HABs? Yes. Uh, so, so in general, the reason why we have blooms during the summer and early fall is because it that's when it's warmest. Uh, cyanobacteria like warmest warm water. They have their maximum growth rate is highest at warmer temperature, but also the beneficial types of algae, diatoms and green algae, can't tolerate those same warm water. So warm waters promote cyanobacteria growth whereas they inhibit diatoms and, and green algae. All right, uh, we've gotten uh, several questions dealing specifically um, with uh, the model. Could you talk about um, whether or not you use the nutrient enriched production rate in the model or the ambient production rate? We took the average of the two. Uh, we, we, we thought that the, the nutrient rich one would be too much of an overestimate, overestimation, but we also thought the ambient, because when you're in a, a mesocosm or, or in a bottle, you're cutting off uh, nutrient sources from the sediments and from other sources. So we thought that might be too much of an underestimation. So we took, we took the average of it. Um, when we look at the 2018 results, uh, the production rates, the model with production rates gave, gave more false positives. So we might take the average might have been too, uh, uh, we might have resulted in you know, falsely high. So the production rates that we used in 2018 might actually have been lower than what uh, we were using in the model. 
Um, how do you tell if a cell is capable of producing microcystin? Yeah, the, you can't tell by looking at it under a microscope or looking at the bloom. Uh, you can only uh, extract DNA and see if it has all 10 uh, MCY genes. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about, um, are there microcystin uh, concentration limits for surface waters, waters or is it solely for drinking waters? So, it, it, uh, yeah, so there is uh, several guidelines and uh, depending on what state you're in or what country, they can be different. Um, the old standard used to be 20 parts per billion microcystins, uh, which is quite high. Uh, Ohio has recently adopted the US EPA's new uh, uh, criteria of eight micrograms per liter. Uh, drinking water uh, in, in, in Ohio is 1.6 for adults and healthy adults, whereas for children and um, others, it's 0 0.3. Okay. Um, another question we had uh, was dealing with microcystins. Um, are microcystins produced by living cyanobacteria or are they released when cells rupture? Uh, well, both. Uh, so my microcystins are produced by cyanobacteria within the cell. When a microcystis cell is healthy, the toxins are contained within the cell. So if you're thinking about water treatment, if you remove this cell intact, you remove the toxins. Uh, if you're adding chemicals to the lake that want, if you want to kill the bloom, but they blow up the cell, that can release the toxins extracellularly. You're not changing the total concentration. You're just moving it from in the cell and to out of cell. And that's harder to treat. Uh, we, got, we also uh, know that uh, viruses in the lake uh, that are specific to sound bacteria can attack a cell and rupture it and release the toxins uh, extracellularly. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about how sensitive microcystin production uh, rate is to temperature changes? Um, and they added a little more clarification. Um, the graphs you showed with microcystin production across summer, for example, did you collect grab samples from Lake Erie in each month and try to keep the water at a uh, temperature throughout the micro, micro, oh, sorry, I can't read it, um, your, uh, I think it must be the uh, your mesocosm experiment. Yeah, so the the water, we, we collected water from the two sites and then we incubated them in the lake nearby. Um, so the, the incubation temperatures were similar to what we collected, uh, where were they were collected? Not exact, but within within a within a degree or two. And if you look at the temperature, across the summer, those two years, it was relatively stable. It only, uh, it got to mid twenties by July and it stayed relatively in the mid twenties by August. The 2019 bloom uh, basically became, uh, uh, it, the, the bloom declined fairly early in September. Uh, so we don't have much production rate data at those cooler temperatures because the bloom just wasn't there. Uh, there's some work that, that's suggesting that temperature impacts uh, microcystin production and that lower temperatures uh, can increase production. All right. Um, another question we had was, um, have you seen any water temperature differences between the Western and Central basins of Lake Erie, which might also affect blooms? 
uh, well, the Western Basin will be warmer than the Central Basin. Uh, the Central Basin won't, uh, so the bloom we're talking about is uh, the microcystis bloom that starts in uh, Mommy Bay, and then it may or may not spill over into the Central Basin, depending on uh, how, how large the bloom is or water currents for, in, for a given year. Um, uh, so the central basin can have, have other types of blooms. It can have an early summer bloom of Dolcospermum or Anabina, uh, also called Anabina, uh, but that is not related to the microcystis bloom. Um, okay. Um, we've gotten a couple of questions, and this will be our last one. And what? And there are other questions that we'll send to Dr. Chaffin for him to take a look at, and uh, we'll get those answers onto the website. But one last question, just because we've gotten several people asking about um, the um, how is the Lake Erie's algae problem the same or different from, say, the red tides events off of Florida's Gulf Coast? They are, um, they're, they're completely different. The red tides are a completely different organism. They're in a different kingdom. They're, they're, they're called dinoflagellates. Um, whereas the Lake Erie bloom are bacteria. They're true bacteria, they're, they're cyanobacteria. So they're completely different kingdoms, um, one prokaryotic, one eukaryotic. Um, I don't wanna say anything incorrect about the red tide bloom, so I'm not a, uh, you know, a specialist there, um, but they produce different toxins. Um, there's probably different environmental factors driving, driving the blooms. Um, so it's overall, it's a, it's a completely different. Okay. Um, all right. So we have a few more questions. I will send those to uh, Dr. Chaffin for him to take a look at and we'll put on to our website. Um, thank you, Dr. Chaffin, for your time, for uh, talking with us today about your algae research. It was really interesting and really an excellent discussion. Uh, I also would like to thank uh, Christina Dickus for her work organizing this webinar. Um, I did want to remind everyone that our survey URL for this webinar is in the chat feature. So please take a few minutes to fill that out. Uh, this webinar series is sponsored by Ohio Sea Grant and will continue next month with Ohio Sea Grant Extension educators, Jill Bartolotta and Scott Hardy, who will be talking about uh, their marine debris research. Uh, the registration link is in the chat. Thank you again, Dr. Chaffin. This was great. Um, and thank you to all the participants on this webinar. We hope this was beneficial and hope you'll uh, join us again in an upcoming webinar. Thank you again and have a great afternoon. Thanks, Justin. All right, thanks.